I'll admit, I got a bit excited when I first heard that Dragon's Dogma 2 was announced back in 2022. I really enjoyed the first game in Dark Arisen and was really hoping that Capcom would do more games in the series, outside Dragon's Dogma Online which was Japan only. But as the years went on from 2013, hopes became wishful thinking and was briefly reignited with the series on Netflix in 2020 and then a reality in 2022. The Dragon's Dogma game is a third person action role playing game set in an open world environment. Just as a heads up, you will see late game content out of context and some minor spoilers which I'll discuss as vaguely as possible but we'll be avoiding key story elements. You're also going to have to forgive my accent on this one, particularly around the pronunciation of the word porn. Dragon's Dogma 2 takes place across two nations, the nation of Vermont and Batal in a parallel world to the first game. The two nations are home to various races including humans, elves, dwarves and the cat-like beastrin. You play the role of either a human or beastrin arisen, a person who has been chosen by the world's dragon and is marked by having the dragon devour their heart. The arisen then comes back to life stronger and with the mission to find and defeat the dragon. Aiding the arisen are the pawns, companions created with the purpose of serving the arisen and helping them on their journey. With Dragon's Dogma 2, our Arisen wakes up a slave in an excavation site. After doing some minor work alongside the pawn Rook, who was also a pawn in the first game, the site is attacked by a Medusa whom you and the other pawns at the site fend off, causing it to retreat. As it retreats, the Arisen and Rook escape the excavation site by jumping off a cliff and fortunately landing on the back of a griffin. The griffin flies across the ocean to Vermont where it's shot down and the two of you land near an outpost. The Arisen is fine but Rook isn't so lucky as he is consumed by the brine, which lives in the water and is fatal to most living things. Guards from the outpost find the Arisen and takes them to the outpost where they are greeted by the pawns located there who acknowledge them as the Arisen. The Arisen is then taken to a nearby riftstone where the pawns reside and the Arisen is then tasked with creating their own personal pawn whom, like the Arisen, can be a human or beastrin. The two are then encouraged to visit the village of Mel where the Arisen remembers what happened to them and after being treated by Ulrika, a woman living in Melv whom the Arisen had saved from the dragon, guards from the city of Vernworth find the Arisen and escort him to the city as the nation's sovereign is supposed to be the Arisen and there is already a sovereign on the throne claiming to be the Arisen. From there, the Arisen truly begins their journey to fight the dragon while getting caught up with the geopolitics of both Vermont and Batal. Can the Arisen solve the mystery of why there's another Arisen on the throne? Will they be able to save the world by defeating the dragon? Is this game any good? Find out in... The Good I feel that the gameplay of Dragon's Dogma 2 is an improvement over the original, bringing some changes while keeping it familiar. As the Arisen, you can have your main pawn and up to two others helping you in your quest. These other pawns are generally the main pawn of other Arisen, and your pawn can also be sent to help other Arisen too. As you travel and fight, your pawns will comment on the events of the game, the type of enemies you're up against and even its strengths and weaknesses if they're experienced enough. If a pawn you have hired has completed a quest that your Arisen hasn't, they may even offer to lead you to where you need to go. While travelling with you, if you defeat enemies in a certain way or if you discover something such as a Seeker's token, which acts as the collectible of the game, or a chest, a hired pawn may comment about telling their own Arisen about it. When you dismiss a pawn, you can rate them and give them an item which they can then pass on to their Arisen upon their return. Pawns can be hired from rift stones found throughout the world or even wandering the road so you always have allies available if the need arises. But be careful, one of the things I've added to the game is an affliction known as the Dragon's Plague, where a pawn will ignore orders from the Arisen and will even kill innocents, requiring you to put down the rogue pawn, though they'll be back to normal once you find them at a riftstone again. This never happened in my game, but pawns do give warning signs when they are infected so you do have the chance to get rid of them by throwing the pawn into water or off a cliff to kill them before it gets really bad, and the chances of it happening is certainly there. The game's combat is quite solid. The Arisen can choose from a number of classes, or vocations, each with their own weapons, with specialties such as the fighter being an all-rounder, the mage providing support and offense from afar, to the likes of the trickster who misdirects and distracts the enemy to name a few. The strider class from the first game has been separated into the archer and the thief class, and both of these have their own focus and specialized skills. 
Each vocation was really fun to play and they all made the Arisen feel really strong in their own way. Pawns can also be assigned vocations but do not get access to certain special vocations which can only be chosen by the Arisen, such as the Mystic Spearhand, Magic Archer, Trickster and Warfarer. As the Arisen and their pawn fight, they can earn discipline points which level up the vocations and unlock new and more powerful skills as well as passive effects. While you don't generally have access to weapon skills when you change vocations, the passive effects can be equipped when you change so it never hurts to master them. The game also has Meisters who can teach the Arisen, and by extension their pawn, a vocation's ultimate skill, and these are obtained through completing quests for them. Some of the skills you can learn from levelling up are powerful, and others such as one of the Mystic Spearhand skills where you launch the enemy off into the distance are pretty amusing. Grabbing monsters return, and a common strategy is that you can grab weaker enemies when they're stunned and throw them off cliffs or into deep bodies of water so the brine can beat them for you. You can also throw enemies at each other to deal damage too, or use the environment to your advantage. Larger enemies you can scale and attack their weak points, or in the case of griffins and drakes, stun them so that they fall to the ground for you to wail on, and it feels really satisfying when you beat them. These enemies are also no match for the brine either, and having them fall into deep water is a legitimate strategy to instantly defeat them, at the cost of not being able to get their materials, which you'll need to upgrade your weapons and armour. Thankfully, while fighting larger enemies, they do have a chance to drop materials when stunned. There have been some changes to the gameplay, and one of these is the Arisen and Pawn's health bar and recovery. As the Arisen and their Pawn takes damage, whether it be from combat or the environment, their maximum health will temporarily decrease, which adds a bit of strategy as to whether you continue your quest knowing that you have less health, and thus less room for error, or whether you stay in an inn or make camp, the latter being a new addition to Dragon's Dogma 2, so you can restore everyone's health back to full. With camping, you can also cook meat that you have obtained through your travels for additional boosts once you've rested. You can get items that can restore the health bar back to its original limit instead of camping or staying at an inn, but these items can start costing and only become more readily available further on in the game. Wake stones also return, and these items can be used to revive the Arisen back to full health upon death, or if you or your pawns accidentally kill someone, or if an NPC gets caught up in the crossfire and dies, you can also bring them back to life. Some dead NPCs can be found in a crypt or charnel house in Vernworth or Barkpatel respectively, after a short period of time for you to locate easier. Wakestone shards can also be found on your adventures, and three of those are needed to make a wakestone. Just be careful that you don't get a wokestone. Forgeries of many items can be made in the game, and it's not uncommon for players to send them away with hired pawns back to their arisen. Another change I liked was how upgrading weapons and armour in different regions or by different smiths can affect the stat increases in weight. Weapons and armour can be normally upgraded up to three times, and some smiths might specialise in strength upgrades, other might specialise in magic upgrades or knockdown power or resistance. This adds another layer of strategy on how to develop the gear that the Arisen or the main pawn uses, and when you find him, there's a certain NPC you can talk to who can upgrade your gear a fourth and final time, to boost their stats and halve their weight, which is a godsend for late game. I really do like, most of, the updated mechanics and changes Dragon's Dogma 2 has brought to the table, and it manages to do this while keeping things familiar for players familiar with the first game. The game's world I think is quite varied and was an absolute blast to explore. Vermand, Batal, and the island that you get to visit are unique in their environments, and I enjoyed exploring every nook and cranny I could access in order to find treasure, monsters, or caves and tombs featuring both. The people in the world also add to the enjoyment as occasionally you may have to rescue people who have been attacked by monsters on the road, or escort them to various locations throughout the world. Sometimes you can even come across travelling merchants who will sell you materials or items that you normally wouldn't be able to find in stores. Some of the game's quests, particularly side quests, have multiple endings, and some can be approached or completed in different ways with positive or negative outcomes depending on how it was approached, when you decided to do them, or how long you had left things as some side quests are time sensitive. Sometimes if you just want to level up, improve a vocation or collect materials, it never hurts to just find a direction and just wander off to see what you can find or go up against. The game does autosave regularly, but you can choose to return to your last inn save if you mess things up and want to resolve a quest a different way. Just make sure that you stay at an inn regularly or you could lose hours of progress. 
If you need to get to some places quicker, you can find port crystals on your journey that you can set down and walk between with fairy stones. Or you can pay, with in-game money, to ride an ox cart to go between places and nap on the way to skip the journey unless the ox cart is attacked. The game's world is approximately four times larger than the one in Dragon's Dogma, and it was an absolute blast exploring it and talking to the people in the world. However, not everything in this game is a blast, so let's look at what didn't work so well in... The Bad. Let's address the elephant in the room and talk about the game's microtransactions. I'll keep this brief as I'm not a huge fan of the principle in which they are used for this game. You can spend real money to purchase in-game items such as a port crystal, only one, for warping, rift crystals you can spend to hire stronger pawns, wax stones to revive people or the arisen, and arts of metamorphosis to edit the arisen or their main pawn. But the items that you can purchase through microtransactions are things that you'll gain access to and afford in the game over time. On the plus side, the game does not force you to see that there's microtransactions available, and before long you'll forget that they're even there since you would have gotten or are able to afford the things the microtransactions offer. I would consider this issue minor in the grand scheme of things. While the game does have varied locations with the two nations in Ireland, the same can't be said about enemy variety which I feel is weaker compared to the first game. I think the game could have benefited with some more unique enemies as you change locations instead of here is this variant of enemy and it's harder to kill. The game dropped the ball on having unique enemies that thrive in a desert environment for Batal or enemies like Treants in the Forest of Ermund. I also think that even having weather events play a bigger part in the game would have been cool such as a sandstorm whipping up while wandering through Batal to make it harder to see, or rain having more of an impact such as affecting your carrying limit since the Arisen and their pawn would be bogged down with water. In saying that, I do think some boss monsters are in good areas, and doing stuff like holding onto a griffin as it takes flight to go back to its nest was pretty cool. I'm also not a fan of some of the game's escort missions. As you befriend certain key characters, you may find them outside of a house that you have purchased wanting to travel with you to a certain location. These locations are always the same place every time you meet them, and all you really get as a reward are flowers that you can give to other NPCs to befriend, which, by the way, also wither if you leave them in your inventory too long. I think having randomised spots where you need to escort these characters would have encouraged exploring the world more. The game story, while I feel was more fleshed out and overall fine, falls with how it treats key characters. Without spoiling too much of the story, you are made aware of key characters in the world as you progress through the main quest, but their importance fades significantly the further you go through the game. For example, a character who wanted to arrange certain events in Vernworth becomes almost completely irrelevant and doesn't have any significant part in the plot once the Arisen needs to go to Batal in the story. Once the story really kicks in though, that's where it shines, but of course you need to meet certain requirements to get to it, and I appreciate that this section revisits the characters the Arisen has met. I think I've covered it all here, so let's wrap things up with... The Opinion Dragon's Dogma 2 I had a lot of fun with, and I spent just under 100 hours doing everything I could in the game before beating it, and even dabbling a little in New Game Plus. The game's gameplay is an improvement over the original, and I really like some of the quality of life changes as well as the game's world. While the microtransactions are a minor issue, where this game drops the ball is not capitalising on making some of the places you visit more unique with more enemy variety or weather effects and the importance of some of the story NPCs. I think if you've played the first game and Dark Arisen, then this game will be an absolute treat, and you don't need to know anything about the first game if you're jumping into this one fresh. Here's hoping that we get more though, because I had a blast with the game, and if you want to hire the pawn that I made, PC version only, here is his code. So with that, it's time for my rating. I would give Dragon's Dogma 2 a fairy stone out of 10. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next Infinite Backlog Review. If you enjoyed today's review, feel free to check out some of our other videos and subscribe for more. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram and our Facebook page. Once again, thank you for watching.